that. The time is seven o'clock. Oh, boy. This is the national program. Of all babies born deaf, about 10% can be helped by surgical means. If the damage is due to obstruction in this part of the outer ear or a defect in the middle ear, we have surgical operations which will remedy these. We can remove obstructions of skin or cartilage or bone from here and replace the ear canal by plastic surgery. But so far, we can do nothing to repair what we might call the electrical system of the ear. That is, the part of the ear which is deep inside the skull and carries the coded sound messages to the brain. Unfortunately, it is damage to this part of the ear which we cannot remedy. And this happens in about 90% of cases where the child is born deaf. We as doctors can do little or nothing to help these babies. But you as parents can help them to such an extent that they may be able to do practically all the things that a normally hearing baby can do. Peter was born with a severe loss of hearing, cause unknown. He's a normal baby who cannot hear, lively, intelligent and always busy. His parents naturally give him all the love and security which every baby needs. A few months ago, they did something else to give a born deaf baby the best possible start in life. They sought medical advice and an early diagnosis of Peter's loss of hearing. Peter doesn't seem to be responding to sound very well. I was wondering if there's anything wrong with his ears and if you have any way of testing him. Uh, usually when the babies are eight or nine months of age or they're sitting by themselves, we do a small screening test for their hearing. So this afternoon we will test Peter's. Peter's hearing, hearing failed the test. So the Plunkett nurse advised an early visit to the family doctor. His examination showed no external evidence of ear disease, but he suspected a fault in the delicate inner ear, a typical result of German measles in the early months of pregnancy perhaps so slight that it passed unnoticed by the mother. As he should have been. Well, I think we must accept that he has a distinct hearing loss and I'd like you to take him to an otologist for a further opinion. Um, I'll give you a, a note to a specialist whom I can recommend. And if you... uh, Peter appears to have an inner ear hearing loss. Uh, this means that at present there is nothing that medical science can do to help him medically or surgically. Uh, I will send you back to the advisor who will arrange to fit Peter with a hearing aid. He will also arrange auditory training and will advise you both what you can do in the home to help Peter. In cases of this kind, otologists cooperate with the education department's local advisor on deaf children, a key man in the National Hearing Assessment and Guidance Service. The advisor makes accurate tests of Peter's hearing loss over a period of several weeks. From the test results and his own wide experience, he can then fit Peter with the most effective type of hearing aid and work out a first program of home training for him. The training will be done by his parents with guidance from the advisor. Working from bases in several parts of the country, advisors bring regular help and advice to parents of young deaf children in their own homes. The first and often most difficult task for parents is to accept their child's hearing loss as a fact, but a problem which they can tackle and overcome. The second is to learn how they can best help their child to communicate with people around him so that he may grow up deaf 
but he will not be dumb. And then parents begin to realize that from small and simple beginnings, with proper guidance, they can offer their child the priceless gift of language. That's a horse. Hello, Mr. McCord. How are you? Fine, thanks, Mr. Fleming. How's Peter? I'm fairly good, thank you. Good. Oh, he's playing nicely here. Hello, Peter. Hello. There's a horse. Yeah, you take the little horse. You saw what I just did then, Mr. McCorn. Mm -hmm. uh, I held the toy up to my face, and then when he looked at my lips, I gave it to him and told him what it was. Now, this helps him to develop speech by watching your lips, which is very, very important. A deaf child has to uh, watch lips and listen to his hearing aid. Would you like to try it with one of the toys down there that he's playing with? All right, then we'll see. Peter. 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 He likes that little car. Does he get that? Yes. Yeah. Ah, that's that's the white car. You take the car. Very good. Yeah, well, that's very good indeed. You watch your face nicely then. And Mrs. McCorn, you can do this sort of thing too all day when you're working around the house. You can hold up spoons and cups and say, say, Mummy's got a spoon. Or here's the cup. And this helps him to, uh, you know, watch which is really Talk to the deaf baby wherever and whenever you can, and always when he looks at you. The important thing is to talk. But he will find it easier to watch your face, the beginning of lip reading, when you sit opposite him with your face as nearly as possible level with his and about four to six feet away. The light should be on your face, not on his, when you speak to him. Now, you see what I'm doing? I'm I've got the microphone of the hearing aid about four inches from my mouth and I'm speaking clearly into it and this means that he will get a very, very clear pattern of speech or as clear as, as, as possible for him. And also, when he vocalises, I pass the microphone over to him so that he will hear himself. And this is very important that you develop... This hearing aid technique is the same for older children. Three-year-old Nicola's mother talks to her slowly and rhythmically in short, easy sentences so that Nicola has a good pattern of speech to follow. Here's the car. We'll make it go. You give it a push. Wrap the path. Wrap the bath up. Wrap it up. It's a good girl. The hearing aid is tested at least once a day by the feedback method. Nicola's mother knows that an aid doesn't give instant hearing and that it helps some children more than others. Her profoundly deaf daughter will hear something like this. <laughs> Even this distorted sound, combined with lip reading, helps a deaf child to learn speech and language and to recognize most of the sounds of everyday life. Ordinary home routine provides many opportunities for teaching natural language, and there's a daily session of learning games. You rub. Give it a rub. The speech trainer, with its powerful amplifier and headphones, gives Nicola more information and sound than the portable hearing aid. Good girl. Here's the water. The water. Put it in. Turn it round. Good girl. Good girl. Look, you put the lady on the foot. Of course, even a good girl becomes a little impatient now and then. And at these times especially, a hearing brother or sister is a great help all round. Here's pyjamas. Here's a pig. Yes. Nicola. Is Dolly's dress. Here's the pig. Sean and his younger brother Jamie often play and learn together. 
Here, a bead threading game which leads them gently into the world of numbers and measurements, the size and shape of familiar things around them. And for the hearing impaired child especially, a scrapbook can be made into a storehouse of ideas for stimulating language and speech. Sean's mother knows that blowing bubbles is good exercise to develop the breath control needed for intelligible speech. Blow the bubbles. To Jamie, though, these elusive, shiny things are something of a mystery. Baby bubble, look. Oh, look at them. A baby bubble. Blow the bubble. So that Jamie can catch them. Oh, that was nice. And to Sean, blowing bubbles is fun in fresh air and sunshine, the natural element of all young children. Mrs. Fahey also uses the scrapbook to play matching games, which helps Sean to learn the names and nature of things in everyday use. And here's your spoon. Look, here's your spoon. That's lovely, and we put it on there. Not on that spoon, no. That one goes over here. In training deaf children of any age, the quality of patience, like Mercy, is twice blessed. It gives the child the time and assurance he needs to make headway against immense difficulties. And his mother's calmness will be absorbed into his own character as he develops in mind and spirit to be an asset to him all his life. Not there. Is it there? Not on that one. Will you do it? Sean enjoys the classic stories of childhood, given fresh interest with models made by his father, told with animation and skill by his mother. And he comes running fast. Over to Sean. Put him by his mummy. Yes! He runs fast. And trot, 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 and put him there. That's right. And look, they're all going for a walk over here behind the house and they sit over there just for a moment and off they trot over there and sit down and you make him try good. Remember always that a child with a hearing loss learns mainly through his eyes. So make his games visually interesting. Present his toys one at a time Enjoy the game with him, and he will take pleasure in learning. But there's no wheel on there. Tip it over. That's better. Push. Screw it on tightly. Screw it on. That's a good boy. That's better. It's on. And, but look. There's no crane. What are we going to do? Wait a minute. Here's the crane. Look. You put it on. On the hole. A little forethought, say, in hiding part of the toy, gives a reason for natural repetition of a word. Thousands of repetitions are needed before a deaf child can recognize a word by lip reading. Where's the nut? What's happened to the nut? I haven't got it. No, I haven't got the nut. It's not on the table. Where is it? Look, I know where it is. It was on your chair. There it is. Screw it on tight. Screw and screw and screw. Tight. That's better. Turn it over. Over she goes. Brrr. Nothing to put on the hook. And I haven't got a car. Nothing. No. Your shoe. Look. There it is. Brrr. Using a hearing aid, the microphone is passed from mother to child and back again. 
In this way, he can hear his own voice and he gets the best possible pattern of sound from his mother. The speech trainer has two microphones, one each for mother and child, so that the child can hear his own voice and his mother's voice at the same time. A model roadway system on a sheet of hardboard is another useful learning game easily made at home. Nothing comes easily to a deaf child. Before he can learn the rhythm and intonation of speech, he must first learn to distinguish and imitate the rhythm of music. So at the end of lesson periods every day, Sean and his mother enjoy a few minutes with Mickey at the xylophone. Hold him for me. There you are. You got your finger in there. Oh, that's better, isn't it? Does he, want, he wants that stick. Good boy. You got it ready? And here's the xylophone. Good. That's lovely. Another art form valuable to all young children is drawing. In Sean's bedroom, as well as the books and pictures he likes, there's a homemade blackboard where he and his mother draw the interesting events and subjects of the day. Will you draw a big bus? But that big, big bus. Come on. One for Mummy. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. You're going to draw it? Yeah. Oh. Ready, set, go. Oh, look how big it is. Would you draw the wheels? You draw the wheels. They usually draw something they're likely to see on their daily walk to the township. For Sean, these walks in the sun are full of learning experiences. Along the road, on the beach, helping mum with shopping in the township. For Sean's mother, this presents new opportunities for improving his speech and language development. Can we get a box up here? That box? That box? That box? This one? Yes. Mrs. Fahey has asked local shopkeepers always to speak to Sean, and one day he will reply to them. An exercise in the good social behaviour which is such an asset to any young child. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Sean. How are you today? You helping Mummy? Yes, yes. You're a good boy, aren't you? Hello, Mrs. Slade. Hello, Sean. Hello. Hello. The local bookseller keeps a lookout for books which may help Sean's language and speech training. Good. Sure. Sure. Yeah. How would you like a book like this? Look at the boy with his drum. With his drum. And what is this here? Oh. What is that, mm. Sean? Fish. Fish. Good boy. Oh, you don't. And. Another fish. A fish that's lovely. More fishes. Yes. Fortunate the deaf child who has brothers and sisters to share his problems and his pleasures. Sean acts out the picture stories in his new book. Now he's a racing car driver, now a fisherman bringing home a fine trout for the family's evening meal. Sure. Sure. 
fish. Fish? Mm. Is it lovely? Mummy's got fish. Mm. Can you find a fish? At the table, Sean is expected to behave as well as his brothers and sister. And Dad, home from work, is on hand to give him a gentle reminder. In the evening, Nicola's father too takes over some of the work which becomes tedious for the mother of a deaf child towards the end of the day. Bath time gives him a chance to play a learning game with Nicola. Later, he experiences once again that special kind of pleasure which comes to every father telling his children a bedtime story. A big spoon is a big spoon. And now, she said, we will bake some cakes and pies and make some jellies and other nice things for you to take home. That's much better than sewing, said Tina. Apple pies and jam tarts and jelly. And as a special surprise, they have even cooked a nice big fat chicken for their mother. There's a plate. See the plate? There's a plate and a bowl. Parents of deaf children also have more urgent studies to make, all the time learning of different ways to help their children. A recent book by a New Zealander now lecturing on deaf children at London University, the Tracy Clinic Correspondence Course, or sharing their experiences with other parents. It's wonderful help has been our parents group, where we've all got mutual problems and we can exchange ideas and helpful suggestions for our own sake and for the sake of our children. Advisor Cherry Reeve, invited to a Dunedin parents group picnic, joins in the fun and helps to answer some worrying questions. How old is Richard now, Mrs Emerson? He's nearly three. Oh, goodness, he's talking very well. I wish Brendan were talking half as well, but he's just babbling still. I wonder what we could do. A Christchurch group has just heard a talk by the principal of Sumner School for the Deaf, a leading authority on the education of deaf children, and the director of the National Audiology Centre joins them for informal discussions. This cooperation between professional workers and parents is of great mutual benefit. It stimulates attention to the whole problem of congenital deafness and strengthens the vital associations of home, school and advisory service in the general progress of all deaf children. I just thought, well, Mr Miller here is... Or, if the hearing aid is skillfully used, he may hear more and more of his own voice. Wellington advisor Elizabeth Husband has some pertinent things to say about talking to the young deaf child. You've got to help him by becoming extremely skillful in the techniques for talking to deaf children, for giving them language. You've got to learn how to help him to watch faces, initially by catching his glance, by talking every time he looks to you. And mothers are all perfectly aware of how often I say to him, he looked at you and you didn't say a word. You've got to talk to him every time he looks. And if you want him to pay attention to what you're saying, then expect him to look. Now it's day, and look, we can put it on there like that. And we can make a little man in this way. And uh, there's the eye. Day, there's the eye. Can you find another eye for me? Can you find the other eye? And then we can put it For parents of preschool deaf children, the New Zealand system of special education provides a free service of guidance in clinics and homes on a national scale. Like that. That's the boy. And there's another eye. There's another eye. And uh, this sort of thing you can do at home quite readily. A lot of parents have uh, tried it already and uh, they seem to be having a lot of success with it. Student advisors and teachers of deaf children also attend clinics during their course of training at Christchurch Teachers College. ...from nine months of age. I particularly want you to observe the use the mother makes of verbs and adjectives. Are there any questions? How deaf is Michael? Well, his audiogram will show this. Uh, in the left ear, there's no measurable hearing. And in the right ear, the thresholds decrease as one moves across to the high frequencies. He wears his speech trainer set at maximum on both sides. 
Through a one-way mirror, students observe Michael and his mother at work, guided by the lecturer in charge of the advisor's course, Mr. M. B. Parsons. Use as many of these words as you can. Michael, here I have a black horse. Would you put the black horse under the tree? That's all right. He walked at the tree. He walked to the tree. That's very good. Under the tree. He doesn't like that one. He likes the big tree. He likes the big tree. Try the fall. He wants the big one. Ah. That's a baby black horse. What called what the baby black horse called? The baby black horse is called a foal. Would you put the baby black horse, the foal, with his, with the other black horse? No, put the smaller tree. Under the smaller tree. That's good. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Not all severely deaf children will reach Michael's standard of speech and comprehension, but given early diagnosis and early training, most hearing impaired children will, at least, be able to understand and communicate with people they meet in everyday life. Across the water. Parents can help their children greatly by giving them experience of the widest possible variety of community activities. The A&P show, for instance, brings Fiona in touch with a friendly pony and his owner. Fiona compares the pony with the model from her toy box. Then she feeds him and touches him and so adds to her growing store of new experiences. Starting school is a big step forward in any child's life. For a deaf child, it's a giant stride forward into a strange new world. You feel. Oh, come on. It's a lot of water, John. Isn't there? Peter. <laughs> Careful home training helps to prepare them for some of the changes in their environment. Habits of cooperation with their own families make it easier for them to join in the life of the larger family at school. In New Zealand, there are three schools for deaf children. A state school at Sumner, Christchurch. A Roman Catholic school that will accept children irrespective of religion at Fielding. and a state school at Kelston, near Auckland. At all three schools, the children are taught through oral methods, aimed at developing the best possible understanding and use of ordinary speech as their main means of communication. Parents' days are especially helpful to children who are boarders at school, giving them welcome reassurance that their parents and family are still at home, that there's a link between home and school. Parents also are reassured by discussing their own child's progress with the skilled and devoted teachers who are helping all the children along the road to independence. Formal speech training begins in the primer classes. Year after year, by sheer hard work, these children and their dedicated teachers are achieving the miracle of communication, the use of language, though the children have never heard a human voice. Be careful. How many have you? Three. I have three. I have three. Tell the other children. 
children. Good. How many has Kevin? By the time they reach the standards, many children are becoming quite proficient in lip reading, speech, and language development. We left school at quarter past nine. We travelled by car. We left school at quarter past nine. Where did we go for our trip? In some ordinary schools, there are special classes for deaf children who are able to benefit from this situation. While their own class is normally in charge of a trained teacher of the deaf, they integrate with hearing children for a number of subjects in the school curriculum. In the arts class, for instance, only the hearing aids distinguish them from children with normal hearing. Now, take it and bang it on your back. Good. The arts teacher has learned the technique of talking to children who cannot hear, a skill which they appreciate and enjoy. Take your thumbs, take your thumbs, and press them in like that. And press round. <coughs> Some deaf children are able to attend secondary schools. In the fourth form at Hillmorton High School, two profoundly deaf girls have topped the class in chemistry. Of a molecule. What does this model represent? Very good. And Cheryl, what does this model represent? Very good. Now, tell me. The ability to communicate with the hearing world, begun at home and extended through school, is the key to achievement in adult life, especially in working with hearing people and earning a living. Susan, for example, has been profoundly deaf since birth. Yet she is now a senior machinist working with hearing girls in the post office, drives her own car, takes part in many community activities. In the peaceful hills of South Canterbury also, there's evidence of a long battle against a handicap fought and won over the years in home and school, college and community. Dennis was born with a severe hearing loss after the 1940 epidemic of maternal rubella. Today, he and his wife Robin, with their baby Catherine, together run their own 700-acre farm. Dennis, ex-diploma student of Lincoln College, is competent in all the work a hearing farmer does, even to training and working his own dogs. In the country and in cities, young deaf people are making worthwhile careers in a variety of occupations. Some run their own businesses. Ken, for instance, works hard at his upholstery factory in Auckland. In the dental clinic at Henderson Primary School, the senior nurse is Ken's wife, Jennifer, who also has a partial loss of hearing. That's all right, John. Now, this about finished polishing your teeth. Now, I hope you'll take great care of them over the next six months. And maybe next time, you won't have too much more. Both Jennifer and Ken have proved themselves able to do responsible jobs of service to the community. 
and like thousands of young working New Zealanders, they've planned and saved for years to build their own home. Now it's almost finished and a rough overgrown section is being transformed into lawns and gardens. One of their most welcome visitors, a friend who's watched their progress with particular interest since their school days, is advisor Peter Apston. I was wondering, Jennifer, if you could give a few words of advice to parents who have young deaf children. Well, firstly, I would say give them love, affection, as they would any other child. Definitely love. And what would you say to them? Well, I would say um, don't spoil them and treat them just like a normal hearing child. Um, and make them take part in uh, everything that their brothers and sisters have to take part in. Is, I think that's very important. Discipline and uh, taking part are very, very important things. A good I point. think, too, the family should not have to sacrifice themselves entirely for the one child. I think the child should blend in with the family, be taught to blend in, to um, join in with family activity, be part of it and the family not be all out just for the one child. Well, thanks very much. That's been very helpful. The natural and acquired abilities of hearing impaired people vary a great deal. And not many deaf children may grow up to speak as well as Jennifer or Ken. But the great majority of them will be able to make their independent ways in the world with confidence, enjoying a full and happy life as responsible members of society. The true spirit of a nation is often revealed by its concern for those of its citizens who are very old, very young, or in some way handicapped. New Zealand provides a range of services for deaf children and their parents as part of the national scheme of social welfare. In this young country, where children grow up in sunshine, the outlook is bright and set fair for a deaf child in the family. The deaf child, like any other child, likes to help mum and dad wherever he can. And of course he should be given every opportunity to do so. Once the deafness has been discovered and specialist help obtained, I think that it's the family which can do most for the deaf child. Thank you. 